The power of one's ability to win stems from their ability to adapt. Snowman 2023. I mean, when you only have sticks and stones for weapons, how much adaptability can you get? Well, that's what we plan to find out, as I happily welcome you back to the continuation of the 50 days video for the Neolithic Brothers series, now aiming to survive a whole 100 days if possible. If you haven't seen the first vid, please go watch it or you'll be sorely confused on all that's happened so far. That said, here's a super quick recap of how we got here. Barbarians forced to use crappy weapons have migrated south for the winter. Many nomads are slain to help fund the party to be now at seven strong, abled bodies. We've lost our monk, our moral guide, and one of our starting barbarians, and truly hope we can overcome the adversities in our way towards slaying the Barbarian King. And finally, this whole series is to celebrate the support you've given through liking, commenting, and subscribing to the channel, as we have definitely have surpassed the 10,000 subs milestone as a result. Don't forget the full playthrough VOD is now out on my second channel, mod list and links to mods used are found on my Discord channel, and you can catch me live on Twitch as well. Hopefully that was enough to jostle the memory back, as we now rejoin our violently inclined crew right after the successful culling of an evil temptress. Feeling confident and keen for more financial options, one full inventory of dyes was hauled down to our favorite southern city-state, Sahat. And as you already guessed, these southern goods were just going to be brought right back across the sands to Sandfells. But as usual, the crossroads had sandy muggers stationed for our return. These last 50 days had really boosted my confidence in my bro's capabilities, especially when dealing with nomads. I eagerly rushed into battle against the 14 strong swarm of half-naked dudes backed by human trebuchet wannabes. Ingo worked hard to dome the targets as fast as she could, but we still had to rush into melee as they had more ranged combatants who were also enjoying throwing rocks from afar. We were taking a few small hits here and there, but ultimately were unfazed as our armor held firm and their rags couldn't withstand our blows. With the indented slain, the slingers were helpless when face to face with our hammers, and we took victory along with nice loot in just six rounds. Also, we have a word from our very first sponsor for the channel. Thank you, Gaijin, for sponsoring this video. War Thunder is a game that is intense and thrilling battles right from the start. Ambush your opponents, engage in head-on collisions, set your enemies on fire, and sink them, all while immersing yourself in stunning 4K detail and authentic sounds that transport you to the heart of real warfare. Including now over 2,000 finely detailed vehicles to choose from, you're able to crush your foes in a powerful tank-on-tank -tank engagements, or switch it up and bomb those same tanks from the sky with the many planes and helicopters available to you. Or my favorite, jump into a battleship and rain destruction from afar. All of this action is free to play and you don't even need a high-end PC to run it all. Go check the link in the descriptions to grab yourself 100,000 Silver Lions, several premium vehicles, boosters, 7 days of premium, and even an exclusive 3D decorator. Hurry, these bonuses are available for a limited time only. Now back to the video. We once again sold our goods at Sandfells and were comfortably sitting on an 8.6k cash stack, a real testament to the last 50 days of struggling and trading. We had finally gotten to a survivable state within this restrictive and dangerous mod. Being restricted to only using Neolithic weapons in this entire game is actually quite a detriment, and we're sitting on some really, really crappy weapons at the moment, and it's hard to really push through damage and enemies, but we've been managing so far, and hopefully we'll manage as we go along. However, there was still one piece of the puzzle that was eluding my comprehension. Notice anything weird in the picture right here? Yeah, I saw it too, and alluded to an issue we had been facing in the last video, but still hadn't quite figured out the problem. Recruits were few and far between, and those we did have available to us were weirdly priced, most being insanely expensive for no apparent reason. Day tailors for 18 crowns a day, 720 up front, nobles for 4.6k and 55 per day, absolutely bonkers and way above what they normally should be like. As expected, this was really hurting my ability to scout and recruit new bros. I'm sure we were on the cusp of the breakthrough solution, but for now I had found Needle in a Haystack. The Widow Elizabeth was a dexterous prodigy with 65 melee skill at level 1. Despite the negative defense, I was determined to use her powerful accuracy with the only real reach weapon at our disposal, the Staff. Now, the luck doesn't stop there, even though he was priced at 18 per day, which is highway robbery for a detailer. Volket had 3 stars in melee attack and 1 melee defense to maybe allow him to do well on the front lines of medium armor. I'd deal with the build specifics later, but was happy the party had some good bros coming in to join our cause. Heading out to grab more quests, we stumble upon a few nomad leaders and their small lost band of southern thugs. Yep, you already know that the snowy loot goblin didn't skip a beat on this chance. Luckily, it was only two leaders, but I couldn't be too cocky in this loot retrieval encounter. Nomad leaders are the biggest threat of the southern mid-game. Strong weapons and even stronger armor, some with shields, and all with the power to pummel unsuspecting parties. But, in this instance, the high risk comes with high reward, as you could be the proud new owner of said weapons, shield, and armor. And yes, if you didn't already know, nomad leaders are the favorite southern prey of snowmen. 
We quickly got stuck into it, but stayed very wary of the leaders. We wanted the leaders to rush us, but as usual, the AI loves to be passive when outnumbering you with ranged forces. So we had no choice and rushed the sword user, Willen, the Gilder's Chosen. Surrounded and under Carlot's net, the Gilder only seemed to have chosen death. At the same time, Mjohed, the Thief of the Sands, flanked north and said, and we had a net ready for him as well. Willen and his heavy armor was quickly getting rinsed by our two hammers. You could see him panicking, and in the last ditch effort, he shield bashed Zebra, who was now free to chase down their annoying archers. Top Flank was working hard to delay for backup when Wiggled finally crumpled the once proud leader into the dirt, so we quickly regrouped to finish off the second leader and the defenseless ranged enemies. There was some risk involved as Elizabeth and Fulkit had to hide in the bushes after being constantly peppered by ranged fire. Gudlik, however, stayed strong soloing the leader the whole time until help arrived to finish the fight with no losses and a stash of nice loot. We definitely took a bit of damage this time, but a helmet and two beautiful Cypher shields and the 115 crowns were totally worth the effort and the risk. Ingo leveled up, and we grabbed Wind Reader without a doubt in my mind. A great perk to boost range skill to keep those stones flying deadly and true. Carlot grabbed Gifted for her level up as those stats helped her accuracy whilst hiding in the back lines. The new equipment was happily equipped, but upon checking the recruit screen in Weissen's stat, I felt like I was sincerely losing my mind. A monk asking for 102 crown daily wage either meant he was the new and upcoming pope, or there was something wrong with the mod. I called up Necro and he assured me I wasn't crazy, and after some more testing, he explained to me about the issues that lurked beneath the surface. Since the mod changed the durability of many items in the game, naturally it was working on reducing metal items to durability on weapons sold in shops and ones looted from enemies. However, this became an issue behind the scenes when dealing with an event generated weapons and recruit generated items. See, the mod only really affects the maximum durability weapons, either buffing wooden or debuffing metal, and the current durability would normally just match the maximum without issue. But events and recruits seem to not conform to the preconceived notion of not going above the maximum durability. So things like a free greatsword from robbing funeral events ended up with a sellable price of over 100,000 crowns, and recruits becoming way too overpriced like Sir Gilzlher was a proof that the game was keeping durability on top of the two maximum durability for these metal weapons that were over inflating their price as a natural consequence. Sadly, all this added up to making my poor Neolithic mercenary company that much more of a struggle when trying to find recruits. With that cleared up and the new version of the mod installed, we still see remnants of the imbalanced recruits but they would fade as time went on as we couldn't just restart the run to refresh all recruits as that would lose all of our glorious progress. Fortunately, the fixes were already showing as we immediately found cheap goaded taxidermist by the name of Wilta who had iron lungs and lovely melee stats. I highly recommend taxidermists and don't know why they're such melee chads but they've frequently been some of the best bros in my parties. Just before heading out on a Follow the Tracks quest to coin up and break in our new bros, we were approached by a crazy decrypted looking old man by the gallows who said he'd pay us $500 redues for the fingers and toes of the recently hanged killer up there. Obviously our trusting men saw no issue with this old hooded figure's request and went to work earning an easy keep. We spot a woman who had already beaten us to the appendages and expertly attempted a robbery. Like candy from a baby, we got tackled from behind and had our coin purse stolen as a result. Wait, I'm sure candy from babies was easier than that. But with 201 crowns lost in a brawl resulting from the chaos, our bros had to abandon the easy task and our coffers suffered as a result. Who knew that the creepy old man's quest wasn't all gun drops and rainbows? Back to the tracks and they led us to 15 thieving rabble and a dog, barely punching bags at this stage of the game but I'm not complaining about free XP loot and cash. Five rounds with barely any resistance had us another successful quest under our belt. Elizabeth gained her first level up and due to the lack of good perks, we chose the slightly helpful Crippling Strikes perk. Not going to do much for a staff build, but at least it's something. Folket, on the other hand, was happy to grab Student to speed up that XP grind. Some repairing and medical gathering later had us hungry for more quests, but low tools meant we had to return to our tried and true cheese of buying and breaking down cheap wooden weapons. Afterwards, we had little choice but to stay in our cul-de-sac, our southern slice of the world, as Sandfells once again had lovely goods for us to legally ferry out of the state. I mean, this was our tried and true calling, and profession at this point. Paint and spice running had our relationships soar with these few settlements, and I couldn't just say no to the profits. Sahet was also our main supply of nets which had been greatly empowering our team to tackle harder and more dangerous foes, like the nomad leaders, so it was great to pick up more on our visit. A two star nomad quest broke up the repetition that was our trade runs and allowed us to clear up that scary nomad city that was spewing up raiding parties near the crossroads. A single leader amongst a plethora of subordinates, Nighttime was surely going to be our ally here. However, since it was early in the day, I was certain I had time to duck into Sandfells to finish a trade run instead of just camping nearby to pass the time. The idea paid off and we only had to wait a short time to ambush the city under the cover of darkness. But wait, the crazy layout of Nomads was only a mass like that because they had orchestrated a treasure dig site and needed extra manpower to retrieve the loot. We had an option to fight their massive numbers now for the extra loot, or... Yeah, screw that. How crazy do you think I am? With wooden weapons, we took the easy way out. The site settled down and what remained were some cutthroats, slingers, a few archers, and a single outlaw. Much easier than the swarm that came before. 
Still, we were pitted against 11 enemies, and I dread to think of how many of there would have been if we had no option. With little effort, we had the cutthroat fleeing by the end of round 1, and since the enemy's projectiles weren't having a large impact on the fight, our rush strategy was doing well. Sure, we were taking small hits, but I had no complaints, as the nomads were definitely our forte at this point, as bodies systematically fell at our feet. Franz may have taken a couple more hits than I'd like, but I'm a serious believer in nomads being afraid of the dark. No other faction really gets so crippled by such an easy setup to the fight. Sure, goblins are ranged, and they usually compensate that by being overwhelming with their projectiles and accuracy, and brigands don't always like the knight, because their master archers, poachers, and marksmen do dislike the reduced accuracy in sight. However, I honestly feel nomads rely on their archer lineup for a large proportion of their damage than they'd like to admit, and it just feels to me that knight is so detrimental to their strategy and overall threat. Strategy and tactics aside, we came out on top rather effortlessly, and I don't feel bad taking advantage of the easier lineup and situation. The loot and XP was nice, plenty of armors, weapons, and cash for the team to enjoy. Will Tep gained his first level up and grabbed student for the usual XP boost that I like to give my bros. We handed in the quest shortly after, but were saddened by the umpteenth time we had a caravan quest on offer that we just couldn't complete safely. The angering of Durbach still haunted the party, and the gatekeeping of practically all caravans we could be defended in and out of our regional cul-de-sac. We sold our loot, camped to salvage some tools, and returned to Samfels empty-handed, devoid of trade goods as we were ferrying these commodities faster than the towns could produce them. Talk about same or even previous day delivery, but fortunately, Samfels pulled through for us and had some paints ready and waiting. They also had a sleuthing opportunity for us as thieves struck their, um, arcane tome of knowledge. Who even has these things just lying around? I don't know. Anyway, CSI Barbarian was on the case, but to our surprise, a man in black was the mastermind behind this skullduckery attempt. I mean, to be fair, it usually is a necromancer behind most evil things we have to deal with here, so there's no reason for me to truly be surprised. Having a necro in the fight really changes how you approach human confrontations in this game. Being able to resurrect two human corpses into zombies every single turn is a tough battle of attrition that many early to mid-game parties either struggle or just can't win reliably. We fought necromancers in our previous series and are used to the snipe or rush tactics to win before getting overrun by zombies. However, we hadn't been tested yet against a foe like this, with only Neolithic weapons at our disposal. So with worry in my heart, we cautiously approached and tried to figure a way through this challenge. Sixteen brigands, a dog, and a necro stared us down and I had to think of something. The dog was an easy kill and an out of mind thought since it couldn't be resurrected. That left 16 brigands that I didn't actually want to kill yet, but somehow had to get past to stop the necro before too much damage was done. We took a loose formation as the brigands rushed us, hoping to distract and landlock as many of them as possible. Wiggle took the high ground as the north side brigands were determined to hard flank our team. Not too surprisingly, but still unexpected, was their fear of Wiggled and their bloodlust for our undefended Slinger and Staff backline. This actually worked in our favor, as Wiggled was now tasked to be the solo strike force to somehow find his way behind enemy lines. Meanwhile, the south flank was struggling to injure but not kill the relentless and slightly damaged walls of brigands in our way. Franz was doing good damage, too good one might say, as he accidentally killed a thug, opening him up to be resurrected and possessed. This was bad, as the Necro could now enter the fight and add more pain and had less time on the clock for us to hold out for Wiggled. However, even with the struggles to control the brigands in the fight, we still had some things go our way. Every step was calculated, and by giving up Wiggle's high ground, the AI had watched too much Star Wars and loved the high ground a bit too much. Yes, the Necro rezzed and possessed the zombie, but the brigands only left a single knife wielder to stop Wiggle's advance. Wiggle just walked past him like he was thin air, desperate for that Necro to be decommissioned as soon as possible. But unfortunately, the art of not killing takes a toll. Trying to maim but not murder still allows enemies to wail upon your bros for free, and we didn't have an endless supply of frontline tanks and armor. Something had to give. The Necro, the Brigands, or us. And sadly, we gave him first. Our level 2 Elizabeth had three thugs surrounding her and we were forced to kill a thug to try and preserve her life. This backfired as the Necro immediately resurrected the thug and Elizabeth swiftly crumbled like a sack of potatoes, struck down, but not dead. But still, not a good outcome as our lines were increasingly struggling to hold back the outnumbering threats. We were swarmed, two zombies on the field, nine allies against 17 enemies, and it was not looking good for our mercenaries. But a beacon of hope, a light switch was turned on by the torch carrier Wiggled, as just now, on round four, he had finally made it to the Necromancer to shut down his powerful resurrections for good. But the real question was, was it too late? I quickly activated the fire at will option for all the bros, and we immediately crushed two brigands and had three white flags quivering on the battlefield. We had to be quick and deadly here. Another three fell soon after, and Wiltit did a mad dash past a zombie to stop those annoying archers that were peppering our team. Battered and bruised, we pushed on, and the Necro was dead in a puddle of his own fresh blood by round seven. Eight shattered and hopeless brigands remained alongside two unwavering zombies, and it was only a matter of two more rounds of cleanup to cement this risky, scary, and downright difficult fight. We took a lot of damage for efforts, Elizabeth survived but was traumatized for the remainder of her mortal time on this earth. Lucky for us though, traumatized is a manageable injury for a backline bro as it only really affects your morale, which is really only needed for the front lines. Phew. 
Benekke leveled up and I was really desperate for accuracy as we were missing a lot and really couldn't afford any lack of DPS moving forward. The last perk I could find on him that could help was Assured Confidence. A strong perk when you're winning, but it can backfire if you're losing a fight. Let's hope we keep up the winning and the morale. Franz graduated with the Masters of Cooking and was able to grab the Quartermaster perk, an absolutely game-changing perk in terms of resource management. Reducing the food consumption of every single borough by one not only saves you money by having to buy less food, but also gives you so much more ease of mind with inventory management and general party management as a result. Fulquet simply enjoyed the extra stats from Gifted to boost his attack and defense to aid the party further, and the loot was mediocre, but the accomplishment of winning a Necromancer fight filled me with a bit of confidence moving forward, as I was certain this achievement was a good sign of a party's strength and capabilities, despite the struggle of a fight that it was. We camped a bit to heal, salvage, and repair, but ultimately returned to the sandy oasis that is Saha to capitalize on our ever-profitable trade run. Stocking up with more nets and returning to Sandfells with more trade goods felt repetitious, but I was sure this excess of money, now 12k crowns, was going to be a very valuable asset to us somewhere in the future, but you can't deny, shiny number go up equals good, right? It was day 62 and Wonderstat was giving us another free XP and cash quest to follow some tracks. I felt locked to this corridor of the world, trapped, but not only trapped to this physical location, I also felt trapped with my gear and capabilities. I know I said the Necromancer fight gave me some confidence, but honestly, we did struggle a little. And would we even be prepared for the next tier of enemies the game throws at us, if we're only farming the weak quests and fights like these? Anyways, I'm not even going to go through the breeze of a thug fight that this was. Yes, rabble upgrading to thugs is the game getting harder and the annoying hillside generation of the map is not my favorite, but thugs weren't a threat to us without a necromancer backing them. No, what feared me the most was knowing that these hammers were as good as it was going to get for a long time, and a power spike for the team was too far in the future to even comprehend, and I wasn't even sure we could get there at this rate. Existential crisis aside, we did get some much needed XP and levels despite the easy fight. Elizabeth grabbed Backstabber to aid with accuracy, and also because not many of our perks were really that useful. Gudlick grabbed the super valuable shield expert as a part of his level up, and since he was a crucial part of our frontline, I was happy he now had this upgrade. Shopping, sand fells, paint, and desert. You know the drill by now. This was a necessity of our survival. Saha welcomed us with open arms and a potential recruit. A fishmonger by the name of Sibylla, Sybil for short, had my favorite trait pragmatic, and a couple of okay stars to boot. However, the asking price of 675 and the chance of her rolling low on base stats had me hesitate, and leave her by the wayside. The only other offer was a 4-star undead mummy fight with a definite run-ending opportunity, and I resumed the simple and definitely much safer trading life. Upon returning to Sandfells, a retired soldier noticed our arrival and was hinting that we should head out and fight again, as his free donation of an arming sword and chest armor was a nice bit of loot even if the weapon was metal and at zero durability. I was getting to the end of this recording session and my tiredness or absent-mindedness, whatever you want to call it, was playing up and somehow I had forgotten to level up Elizabeth Gudlick and now Seabra, who I don't even know where he got the XP from, as well as forgetting to actually sell the dyes from the last trip to the south. Goodness me. I was definitely losing my mind, but was very happy to see Seabra leveling up and grabbing Lithe to enjoy some medium armor damage reduction. After selling the goods, we found an apprentice that tempted me with his almost okay stats. Tyno really tried to sell himself as a capable bro, but I knew deep down he wouldn't be able to cut it like our team needed. We had the excess cash and we needed to use it to pull in great bros, not just good ones. We checked Wonderstat for more potential bros, specifically hunting for more range support as Ingo was certainly carrying the team, but I was hellbent on capitalizing on the power that is extra range. Amelia was the Fletcher that caught my eye, and even though she wasn't a slinger, she could still rock a bow, and with the help of Wind Reader, Fast Adaptation, and Ballistics down the line, she could definitely bring in some much-needed range power to the team. For the first time in a while, to find more bros, and to keep the quest turning, I broke out of the safe Southlands and headed north on a delivery. Mind you, Philstein wasn't really that far away, but maybe they or a nearby castle had something I was missing. But instead, what I found first was a wonderful reason as to why I should have stayed in my lane. The Bulwark was a fellow mercenary company just traveling from one job to the next, but happened to be currently hired by the very northern yellow faction who absolutely hated my guts and wanted me dead. So they chased us with murder in their eyes. A quick juke out of the way and some brigands had them immediately distracted by shiny potential loot and we got away safely. Phew. Delivery complete and to my surprise Philstein was offering a nice 3 star brigand location quest, a lovely change of pace and a hopefully not so deadly challenge as well. Raiders were not surprising at this stage and I just hoped we were prepared enough. Nighttime bothered their poachers more than Ingo, and we walked into an 11 vs 20 fight ready for a brawl. The map generation wasn't too bad, and I tried to funnel some choke points, but did a small blunder in the south as I totally didn't notice the gap in my strategy. Our setup was good, Ingo got to work with that sling, but Franz was right for the enemy to rush, and I had to scramble somehow to control the weakness I made in my bottom flank. The AI was playing chess whilst I was still playing checkers, as I planned to use Wiltip to shield bash the axe wielder to save Franz, but the flail wielder body blocked and made sure he was there to stay. Dang it. 
Ingo helped soften him up, and Franz set him up to be killed and replaced by Wiltet. Phew, dodged that scary bullet. While all of this was worrying and taking most of my attention, Top and Middle Flank were having a fairly easy time with their foes, but my carefree feelings would soon subside. We were still outnumbered 16 to 11, and even though the southern tide was quelled, the enemies were rotating north and I wasn't killing them fast enough. Dudlick was bravely holding out against two strong flankers, but more were coming. Wiltet was taking rough hits from the flail user, but Franz helped him win that engagement. Beneke was not enjoying the middle flank, and getting shield bashed constantly was making his job of DPSing pretty difficult. South flank was one and aimed to rush their archer line as we pulled Franz back to help mid. We evened up the numbers after creating a corpse collection in the middle of the battlefield, but my success was my undoing. I had focused too much on what was in front of my bros, and accidentally left an axe raider slip through the gaps and engage both of my range bros. Pure panic and desperation. We netted him, and a nice headshot from Elizabeth broke his nose. Lucky I had emergency shields on both ranged rows and pulled them out to weather my mistake. But RNG had other plans. Breaking free of the net on a 50% and headshotting Ingo on a 41% really showed me that this game was out to punish my mistakes and cripple this run. Ingo was such an important pillar to this team, we couldn't lose her now. We were getting kills on the other side of the battlefield, but this is what truly mattered. Wiggled whiffed a 65 hammer swing and the dread truly set in at this stage. I re-netted the raider, but even under a net the raider was faster than Wiggled, and knowing my RNG our chances of survival were slim. But then out of the blue, Carlot whips out her staff and hits him square where his nose should have been, and the second headshot in a row crumpled him to the floor. This was the pure luck moment I needed to save our valuable slinger's life. The rest of the fight was vastly less of a risk, even if Volket was sitting on the low ground without a shield to defend himself. Ingo's life was saved this day and I only had my tunnel vision to blame for getting her into that situation to begin with. Carlot rightfully leveled up as a result and Colossus would ensure she could take a little more beating before I got worried about her. Fulquet also leveled up and grabbed a Colossus for that healthy survivability. Amelia enjoyed her first level and fast adaptation was a no-brainer here. The loot was very nice, furs, 387 crowns, and a helmet to boot, very nice rewards. Some camping later and an eastward trek to Gronfest was hopefully the castle of recruiting dreams. Yet, why do I even try? What the heck are these two expensive and useless recruits? Bah, the Southlands are so much better. At least we grabbed a nice and cheap two-handed hammer for 430 crowns as Wiltet was improving fast and could use it within a few levels. Just as we were returning to our adoptive homelands, a feral dog began following the party. The men were unsure of how to approach the situation, but I assured them the dog was friendly and probably able to be convinced with food. It usually works on me, so why not? A chunk of meat was all it took to win over the pup's heart, and satiated Battle Brother was now Amelia's new watchdog. On our way back south, I specifically wandered around in search of an enemy location. Anything would do to help complete our current party ambition. Coming up empty was a tough feeling, but look, a set of undead tracks. Maybe they have a location nearby. Oh crap. That's 30 zombies. Probably too much to handle, so let's scram. Fleeing to the mountain peaks, we noticed an unidentified beast group completely reduced those zombies to atoms, and we resumed our location hunt. Checking on the beasts, they were found to be a group of 20 strong spiders. Kiting them to another mountain range finally revealed a hidden undead hut. Geists were abound. Hmm. Without rally of the troops, that would certainly be a tricky fight. Wait, where's Snow? Oh, crap. He's gone and lured the spiders into the location, and now it's a three-way brawl. Panic set in immediately as two spider eggs somehow spawned behind the party, an occurrence I've never seen before. But with quick thinking and actions, both were dead before they could pump out eight-legged horrors. Another great development was how distracted the spiders and zombies were with each other. My somewhat of a plan had worked, and most of their forces were set on taking each other out. This let only a handful of spiders trickle to our front line for more of an easily managed fight. Round 7 and we found ourselves alone in the dark, but the map still had 23 enemies left. This was good to see them both still fighting. Oh, that's not good. Yep, that's a fleet of confident spiders emerging from the dark. Guess we now know why they were able to beat the last undead party on the world map. We never got to see a single zombie or geist, but I seriously expected them to put up a better fight than this. A lot of spiders remained, and this was rough. Bottom flank was swarmed so much that Amelia had to release Battle Brother just to get a spider off of her, but shortly after more arrived. Wiltet wasn't doing well surrounded by arachnids, and a devastating headshot bite whilst webbed did 35 damage, and now he was poisoned on... Oh, wait, he's dead. Man, spiders are brutal. 14 spiders left, and we were faltering. This was not good. Everything was in chaos. The dog stole Beneke's spot, limiting our DPS. Wiggled was constantly webbed as a main holder of a top flank, but it was nice to see Franz dish out some much-needed kills. Round 13, and we only had managed to get two kills in two rounds. This was going too slow, and we'd be dead if nothing changed soon. A sweeping strike from Ben, and another spider falls. Ingo gets jumped, but the emergency shield gives a bash to set our rangers free. Amelia snipes another spider, but so many other hits are non-fatal. The shield bash once again saves our rangers, and now Franz and Ben take two more kills. We're finally feeling like numbers are getting managed, but fate was already set in stone. For you see, Wiggled, our loyal barbarian, was bitten and brought down to 6 HP. But wait! The poison just ended in time, and although hanging by a thread, Wiggled was still in the fight. Another hit to Wiggled, and he was on 4 HP! 
the dog grabs a kill. Our bros are over exhausted from breaking out of webs, but at least Franz now skewers another spider to reduce them down to five. Wiggled pulls a 33% out of his hat to completely free him from the risk of death, as he now stood alone amongst corpses. Godlick was struggling with three spiders surrounding him, and he was also on very low HP. The four remaining were brought low, but holy crap, what? The merciless AI knew exactly how to ruin our victory, and it found the perfect 4D chess move and the anti-snow RNG to footwork a confident spider and completely murder Wiggled in poisoned blood with a 44% no less. Wiggled was fated to die this day no matter my efforts at keeping him alive. It was a very sad loss of our second barbarian, leaving only Beneke as this lone survivor of our original quartet, now alone to carry on our original will forward. Insult to injury, Folket dying to poison on the last tick with exactly 10 HP left and no antidote in sight to save him was just pain. At least Gudlick survived by the skin of his teeth to keep our front line somewhat alive after such a devastating fight for the team. Two deaths literally seconds before the end of battle and I could only sit in frustration and wonder at what could have been with a small amount of luck going our way. The loot wasn't worth the struggle and the loss, but at least the small silver lining was that beating the location completed our ambition. But now with only eight bros and one barbarian to carry us, we really needed a miracle to keep up with the DPS demand, as the game was clearly getting harder and losing bros was not the answer. Were we going to slowly whittle down to nothing, or could we bounce back? I wasn't sure, but I was certainly going to give it my all. We laid our fallen to rest and immediately completed the Noble House ambition, as now we had unlocked Noble Quests. Maybe this was the way. Back-to-back -back completions were always nice, and we chose the next ambition as a destroy four orc locations, as we originally aimed to fight them to loot the best Neolithic weapons in the game. Back to the safety and security of our cul-de-sac, I had to pump out a rebuild of some sorts to get this team back online. Wonderstat did not have much, but Sandfels had a glorious hunter to finish our trifecta of ranged bros to keep the pain flying towards our foes. Magdalen, or Magda for short, was our second bow user ready to snipe for the team, and choosing student for her level 2 perk was a great way to get those levels faster. We also picked up an amazingly statted militia named Burnat Aton, Bernie for short, but we had an issue. His weapon options were practically unviable, but the stats were too hard to ignore, and I left his weapon choice as a future snow problem. With our team of 10 strong bros, all we needed now was a training montage with quests and training to get them up to speed. Hyenas chased us on our Follow the Tracks quest, but four rounds went by very quickly, as did the lives of the rabble before us. Elizabeth leveled up and grabbed Staff Block as an insurance policy. I wasn't aiming to put her on the front line, but 16 free melee and range defense was good in a pinch. Amelia was starting her power trip with three nice kills and now some healthy survivability from Colossus due to her level up. We easily outran the Hyenas, and they got sidetracked and actually lost to a basic caravan along the roads. Completely laughable. We then resumed our trading stint to Sahat, my perfect math skills, aka luck, had just barely escaped death as we rode into town with an empty coin purse. It was here that I noticed a familiar recruit in town. Ever since we tried her out, Sibella, Sybil for short, had been waiting for a return for me to get desperate enough. And while on our rebuild arc, I was desperate, and adding her to the team was a decent choice. We then grabbed our first caravan in forever out west to the other city-state of Cherie, obviously training along the way for even more free XP. Doing a drive-by fast and furious moment, we dropped another caravan along the roads for free tools and safely pulled into Cherie, where we enjoyed four lovely level-ups from all that training. Burn grabbed the ever-strong Steel Brow to enjoy some of that stun immunity, Sybil grabbed the XP boost of Student, Magda went with fast adaptation for her level-up, and finally Ingo got that beautiful DPS boost of heavy rocks to ensure her deliverance of pain. Since we were back at Cherie, the arena called to us, but replied, new number, who dis? Because they wanted to pit our bros against three frenzy hyenas. Super hard pass. While camping our worries away, Magda mentioned a bunch of refugees were outside our tent waiting to urgently speak with us. He said that the greenskins were attacking. I said, that was nothing new. But asked them which ones, orcs or goblins? The reply was very worrisome. He said both. Orcs and goblins were working together, and a greenskin invasion was underway at this very moment. This was very bad news. Not just for the whole kingdom, but for our very own party. We wanted to fight greenskins to get to that next power level, but I was very worried we weren't ready for this fight yet. Being behind on the scaling curve in this game is very rough indeed. So I picked myself and the team up, and we trained even harder than before. Our training camp produced four more of those very much needed levels. And Beneke grabbed muscularity, a desperate boost to his damage output. Sybil went for Colossus as a health boost, because God knows those orcs can hurt. Magda needed accuracy, and Gifted was a good choice for that. Amelia didn't have many options, but Bullseye could help us snipe a foe in a pinch. Training through camping seemed to have been our best choice, as the arena was offering four frenzied hyenas this time, even worse than before. We enjoyed the new levels from the grind, but I headed back east to switch things up. Luckily we did, or we wouldn't have found a small scared band of nomads, with a lone leader who was just begging to be mauled for their juicy loot. I couldn't resist and chased them into the night. Two melee and six ranged foes meant we were peppered a bunch, but they also stood no chance of winning. 
Carlot was brought dangerously low with some unlucky headshots, but I still had hope and nets to work around this. I didn't even panic when the leader ran up to her wounded face, because it wasn't very long till he was face down in the sand instead, and Carlot was still standing for the victory screen. We came through with no losses, decent XP, but more importantly great loot and a blessing of a great pillager proc. We had to demolish the armor of that leader to save Carlot to get a quick kill, but the game said take it anyways as a zero durability drop. Northern Raiders for the win. A great armor upgrade for the team, and we also enjoyed the benefit of shield expert from Carlot's level up. We finally arrived to see Sandfells in all its upgraded glory, once a small town, now a big city. We knew we had done well down here in the south and the locals were booming because of our support. A follow the tracks was our first quest from this newly upgraded settlement. Nine rounds involved little risk for our bros as Amelia got a little bit low on HP, but we cleaned up the thugs well enough to enjoy the free cash and XP. Godlick and Sybil leveled up, but I didn't have time to give them their stats and perks because stinking snakes popped out of nowhere, and we desperately led them into the local militia as to not be decimated by the slithery foes of nature. I won't go all dramatic on this one though. Kills were stolen, but the main takeaway was that we practically took zero damage with our great positioning and sacrificing of law enforcement to save our bros' hides, and win this fight in only seven rounds from a beautiful high ground advantage. Snakes are very dangerous, but if you use other people's lives to kill them, they're not as bad as they could be. Godlick grabbed Underdog, Sybil grabbed Resilient, and Franz grabbed Inspiring Presence to hopefully help boost the party's morale at the beginning of fights. Quests and Scary Snakes complete, and now Sandfills gave us our first Noble Quest. My favorite patrol quest was immediately accepted, and we quickly found that the roads to Weissenstadt were void of enemies. First step complete, but just as we took off towards Durbach, Orc Marauders appeared and I immediately turned tail. A caravan spawned in front of them, and it didn't even whittle down a single Orc. But we banded together with the next caravan to take on this next level of foe. The map wasn't super favorable, but our three rangers got to work immediately and the Berserker was already bleeding profusely. A lucky bullseye snipe from Amelia it was all that was needed to bring that Zerker's white flag up, and an orc young was quickly slain afterwards. Carlot took a very scary 13%, but other than that we were managing the warriors fairly well. The young were having fun with the caravan hands, but not posing much of a threat to the rest of us. We were strongly winning, but a tactical blunder had a warrior in my back lines. Luckily it was too late to matter for the greenskins, and we won decisively with no one but Carlot taking any damage. Just magnificent. The kills were a nice reward for our patrol quest, but even more so was the nice weapon upgrade of a tree limb. Okay, let's be real, this weapon sucks. But it isn't as bad as wooden spears, which we were still rocking by the way here on day 85. Zebra leveled up and grabbed last stand to survive against all odds in a pinch. Elizabeth enjoyed the benefits of staff mastery from her level, as her staff was already doing some nice numbers on our enemies. We did a quick drive by to Durbach to finish that stint, and then went on a walkabout to find more heads to fill up our quest. We found a very scary orc location, but knew it was too much for us. Luckily, a nomad hideout was more suited for our capabilities. Running out of time for the patrol had me attack them immediately in daylight, but this was not an issue, as they only had one archer and one slinger. 15 versus R11 seemed tricky, but was actually more breezy than expected. Sure, we took some annoying snipes, but ultimately the ranged power worked in our favor, as the Nomad after Nomad were sniped and collapsing before our veteran bros. Magda leveled up and was happy to grab Bow Mastery for that range and fatigue discount. We made it back to town in time to hand in the heads from the patrol quest, and we now had a massive stash of paints to head back south with. Down here in the Sandy Seas, up at Sandfills, and even Weissenstadt, somehow were offering either quests that were not worth our time, or quests that would certainly get us killed. We were a bit at a loss at the moment. I had to change pace for sure here, especially since our lovely butcher Sybil decided to have a weapons out talk with our dog that we just so happened to break up in time. Hmm. Our change of pace was heading out west to see if there was more orc locations that were easier to hit than the massive one we spotted earlier. And to my surprise, we lucked out and found one. But my confidence wavered and I looked to cheese a roaming party into the location. Very unsuccessfully, I might add. Very unsuccessfully. Instead, we took a one-star noble quest to get paid for a different greenskin location. But lo and behold, 700 crowns to fight a behemoth. The game was truly insane, but I couldn't back down now. Six enemies made the tactics easier, but we still had a crazy fight ahead of us. The young weren't sniped fast enough, but at the start of round three they were all dead as the netted behemoth and naked berserker were wavering. The berserker didn't even land a single hit before melting in front of our confident bros. The warrior had sense and was breaking at the sight of his allies falling around him. The behemoth, scary as he may be, was eventually the lone surviving punching bag amongst a field of green corpses. 11v1, surrounded on full HP, and he had already given up the fight, but we still had to spend two full rounds taking down that insane insane 800 HP health pool. And despite my initial fears, we actually came out of that fight with only 5 damage received. 
Our team was turning out to be very reliable, and my tactics not too shabby. Or so I hoped for our future. But the real victory here was not the untouchable success, it was in our new acquisition. Sadly, the Behemoth's two-handed cleaver didn't drop, but a meat hacker was now in our possession. A powerful two-handed orc axe, precursor to the man-splitter. Wait, what? It's not a two-handed axe? It does less damage than our two-handed mallets? You're joking, right? No, wait. I have an idea. One-handed, hits once per turn, uses split man for a head and a body hit at the same time. Sure, it's not that great of a weapon, but for our one-handed shield DPS bros, who I originally had no idea how I was going to build them, now we had the perfect endgame Neolithic weapon for their builds. One-headed axe with a shield was a nice strat, and alongside Carlot with her fancy tree limb mace, we were looking more barbaric by the minute. A little training later and Bernie enjoyed axe mastery from his level up to cement his build further. Amelia was definitely happy about the buffs from Bowmaster to keep the rangers strong. The dagger den was too scary, and the jagged hatchet den should have been a good choice, but I got distracted by green footprints and decided to chase them down. An 11 strong party of warriors and young had migrated from the small camp to bolster the large camp we were afraid of, and they didn't like us being here. A hill fight broke out and I was sure this was going to be a walk in the park. Our rangers set to work on whoever they could soften up and quickly two young were dead. Bernie's new axe had a beautiful first showing, but he hit the headshot instead of the body shot. Oof, missed kill right there. Regardless, the fight was quickly turned into an 11v8, but those warriors were hellbent on pushing through and flanking. My positioning was terrible and Elizabeth was dropped low by two warriors now within our ranks, and nothing could stop her bleeding to death on that hill. The warriors didn't stop pushing, holding up our archers and even one flanked behind whilst the others flanked the side. Amelia was their next cull, Magda was struck down, Ingo was killed, then Gudlik was killed. It was a complete fiasco and failure, a definite end of the run. We somehow won the fight, but the losses were overwhelming and too much to continue on. I made a cocky mistake, and realized I didn't even use a single net that fight. The power of money, the power of trading, the classic snow tactics, I hadn't used my full arsenal of game knowledge or equipment. So, I picked myself up, gave myself a single save scum to allow myself to reset my overconfidence and play properly, and see whether it was just an unwinnable fight, or was it my fault all along. The rematch had a slightly better map layout, but immediately I set to work on my formation. Range targeting, and had nets already prepared. This was the Neolithic run for goodness sake, Snow. An underdog challenge, a fight from behind to clamber on top of whatever the game can throw at us. Let's start fighting like it. Immediately round two, we made a young flea, but Seber got stunned by a charge, and an orc warrior rushed our back line. Snow, you're meant to be doing better, not worse. Regardless, I pressed on. With a looser formation, we were able to stall out most of the enemies and use nets to assist with wasting time for our slower DPSs to get kills. Slow DPS is the right term, as it took till literally round 4 to finally get our first kill, but a warrior was down, his compatriot was now fleeing too, and good progress was being made. I had to be aggressive with my rangers and keep them close to the fight to keep up the DPS. This invited the young to push through, but also baited them into kill zones. This resulted in three swift young kills, and since Gudluck was being the solo Chad tanking and holding the top flank, the rest of the team was actually powering through the remaining orcs rather well. We didn't forget to use nets even though we felt like we were winning. It was this more cautious and methodical approach that allowed us to make it just in time to save Gudluck once his shield gave out in front of two menacing warriors. Carlot took the brunt of our received damage, but the rest of the team was only lightly battered as we very proudly claimed this victory of a rematch. I was determined to play with caution moving forward, and my single lifeline was used up. Our next defeat would definitely be our last. No other orcs chased us down as we returned to Sandfills to lick our wounds and relax on a nice Follow the Tracks quest as it was getting close to the 100 day mark. A leader amongst 9 enemies was a laughable and measly show of force compared to what we just came out of, so we enjoyed the simple fight while we could. Almost zero damage taken, but almost zero loot as well. Fair enough. A Necromancer approached just after the fight, and I was slightly tempted by the 2200 payout compared to the town's asking price of 840. However, I wasn't bought that easily, and the town was successful due to our efforts and our proud men, and I declined that offer. Adding to our relaxing time back in the cul-de-sac was a rare offer of a caravan headed south to Saha, a wonderful opportunity to sort out our inventory, salvage, heal, and repair, so off we went. It was uneventful, but at least our trade was boosted by the camping rewards. I was still worried that Durbach hated our guts and was annoyed about their gatekeeping, so when I noticed Sahat was offering a delivery to Durbach, as any quest to a settlement increases relations slightly, I jumped on that to mend the broken bridges. But I must be internally cursed for my mistakes, because somehow we rolled a 10% chance to have mercenaries hold us up at sword point for the goods, and there was no way in the world we could beat a group of mercenaries as we were currently. So once again, I had to betray the relationship with Durbach and cement their hatred of us as we now are certain to never see a long caravan quest again. 
With heads hung low, we took our story behinds to Sandfells in hopes that something would cheer us up. We sold our goods and were happy to see the yellow faction at least not giving into the hate and opening themselves up for business. Definitely we'll have to give them a visit in the future. But for now, a one star defended the town was not enough to keep me here, so off to Cherie we went, to maybe say hi to the arena and drown my sorrows under the unabated roar of the crowd. But alas, four frenzied hyenas was all that those crazy showmen could offer us, and I know I'm crazy, but not that crazy. A two-star nomad quest was my only solace. A simple but easy murder of wandering thieves would quell the pain for sure. But a different type of quelling was on the game's mind, of course. Ours. The cold desert night of the hundredth day, and I'm afraid I must leave you all there in suspense of what will transpire in our barbaric adventure. We've become kings of the south, but will the south find a way to claim back its title? We've tasted a slice of orcish success at the start of this greenskin invasion, and are keen to expand our arsenal much further than just the two new weapons at our disposal. Our finances are stable, but our crew is not. Beneke stands alone on the ideological front, backed by many capable bros, but he is without his original crew, his friends. But maybe this adventure is about the friends you make along the way, as we head towards a unified goal to slay the king. Tune in next time to see how the party fares with the late game challenges ahead. Once again, don't forget to check out War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat PvP game ever, and remember to grab the massive free bonus pack from my link in the description to enjoy free vehicles, premium account time, boosters, and that sweet 3D customizer. Thanks again to Gaijin for sponsoring this video. Don't forget the full playthrough VODs can be watched on my second channel, and why not hang out with me on Twitch while I'm live, or just chat in my Discord channel where you can also find all my mod lists and links to the mods that I use. That's all for me, so I hope you enjoyed, and I'll catch you in the next one. See yous.